In this lecture, we're going to study how the poles affect the temporal response. We already started this study when you looked at overdamped, underdamped, and unstable systems. Now we're going to repeat that process and generalize that a bit more as a function of a given parameter in the system. That is, we want to know how a certain parameter can affect the location of the poles in the system as that parameter changes over time. That parameter could be a control gain that we can tune or could be a parameter that changes during operation in the system. The objective here is to understand how the poles will evolve as that parameter, uh, parameter changes and then create a map of all possible location of poles so that we, ha we have the entire picture of the system for a given range of that parameter. This lecture is a bit heavy in content. There's a lot of information here, uh, but it's based on pretty much what we studied in, um, in one of the past lectures. So we're going to introduce a concept here called the root locus method. And that's uh, simply a map of all location of poles in the S-plane as a function of a given parameter. And you're going to use MATLAB to calculate that. We don't need to uh, do that by hand. So that will simplify our, um, our job quite a lot. So by the end of this lecture, I wanted to understand how one parameter can affect the location of poles in the system and be able to read a root locus plot that we'll uh, create using MATLAB. There are several applications of this. For example, here we, we have a ventricular assist device that is simply a mechanical pump that uh, regulates the heart uh, function. If one parameter in this system, such as an amplifier gain, for example, changes during operation, or if you tune it, how does that affect the stability of the system? How does that affect overshoot and um, time response of that system? Well, we can use the, this me the method you're going to see today to assess that. Here's another example. We have this transfer function that here represents the blood pressure response measured by a transducer. So this is a second order system with a uh, combined with a pole at P1. And you see that these two parameters, these two functions, these two polynomials have two parameters that may change during operation. If one of them changes, how does it affect the response of the system? Is the system always stable for a range, that range where this parameter is changing? Is there going to be any overshoot and so on? You can again see that using the method. Here's another example. Again, we have a uh, a transfer function h of s at this time we are developing a controller for it and the controller is the proportional controller k and this is a uh, representing here a infusion system a drug infusion system to uh, control the amount of drug in, in the body if this parameter k changes how does that affect the response of the system in this particular example we want to limit overshoot for example we don't want the drug level to go beyond a certain value before it settles what is the limit of k that it will have the system with no overshoot, with overshoot, and even make the system unstable? So to evaluate all of these questions, to answer them, all we have to do is to figure out where the poles are, because the poles are the ones that uh, dictate the shape of the time response. The zeros will also do, uh, will have an influence on the time response. But if the system is overdamped, underdamped, unstable, that is only a function of location of poles. So if you look at if you look at the location of the poles for all possible values of that parameter that is changing, then you have a clear picture of how the system behaves uh, for that range of that parameter. And this method, the method we're going to use to map that, is the root locus method. You remember this from the past lecture. When the poles are on the real axis, on the left side, the system is overdamped. When they break away from the real axis and become complex conjugate, is still on the left side, the system is overdamped. When you cross the imaginary axis, on the imaginary axis, the system is marginally stable. And to the left, to the right of the imaginary axis, the poles have positive real parts, which will make exponential go to infinity, and the system becomes unstable. So, if you have this system here that uh, is given by this transfer function and you have this parameter k 
what value of k should we choose to meet a desired performance requirement in terms of overshoot and settling time? If k is not exactly as predicted, how does it affect the time response of the system? For example, in a plane, if an airplane takes off, the mass of the airplane decreases over time. So that would be equivalent to have this parameter k decreasing during operation. Would that make the system unstable? Would that uh, make a system that is otherwise overdamped, underdamped, and so on? Well, to figure that out, what we can do is to simply plug in several different values of k and then plot the location of all poles. I just solve the equation, the, the characteristic equation for, value, for different values of k, find where the poles are, and then plot all of them in the imaginary S plane. But there is an easier way, but what we are doing is essentially the same. And why is that important to know where these poles are? Because we have all the information we need about the system response in the time domain by simply looking at where the poles are. Going back to one of our past lectures, if you take the denominator of this transfer function, which we now call the characteristic equation, and you find the roots of the characteristic equation, that is the poles of the transfer function, we have two poles for a second order transfer function, they are given here. Right? So they have an imaginary and a real part, here is the real part, here is the imaginary part. We can plot that on the S-plane, here is the pole, we have its imaginary part here, omega n square root of one minus zeta squared, and at the bottom here, we have the real part, which is negative zeta omega n. What is this distance to the origin? Well, this distance is easy to calculate. Just use the norm of that vector, which is the real part plus the imaginary part squared, the square root of that. So zeta omega n all squared plus square root of, sorry, plus omega n square root of one minus zeta squared, which is the damping ratio, all squared. And if you solve for this, it's a very simple equation. This turns out to be omega n, the natural frequency of the system. So by placing a pole on the S-plane, we already know the natural frequency is the Euclidean distance of that pole to the center of the S-plane. That's the first information because we know that the, the uh, natural frequency affects the, the settling time. Remember, it's 4 over zeta times omega n. So by placing a pole there, we know immediately what the uh, natural frequency is. Now let's calculate, for example, a random angle here. Let's take this angle theta. What is that angle theta? Theta is zeta omega n, sorry, is the sine of, put it this way, sine of theta of that angle is zeta omega n divided by omega n, which is simply zeta. So that angle is the inverse sine of zeta. So by now looking at the angle of that line with the imaginary axis, we know the damping ratio. When we move this point around the S-plane, we are changing the damping ratio of that specific pole. We are changing the overshoot, and we are also changing the natural frequency of that specific pole. We are changing its response time in combination, of course, with the damping ratio. If we move the damp this pole along this line, up and down, what, what happens? Only the natural frequency changes. So the closer it gets down, the, the smaller. The, the, the higher the uh, settling time, whereas the damping ratio in this case remains constant. If you take this pole and move it along this arc here, the distance to the origin doesn't change. So the natural frequency remains constant and the damping ratio uh, is changing as we move it. Right, so by placing a pole in there, we know the damping ratio and we specify also the natural frequency. In other words, we are specifying the settling time and the overshoot of that specific pole. As designers, when we want to develop a control system for any application, our job is to make sure that the poles are where we want. 
we have the ability to change the closed loop poles of a transfer function by putting that into a feedback loop, as you're going to see later. And our control gain will make these poles travel. And if you want them to meet a certain requirement in terms of overshoot and damping and um, settling time, we know exactly where to place them now. All right, so this is a summary of what I was presenting earlier. For example, we know that the settling time is 4 over zeta omega n, which is the real part of the pole. So the poles that are located in this region here will have a settling time is smaller than a certain maximum value that we want to allow. The poles that are inside of this arc, they have a natural frequency is smaller than a certain value we are willing to allow. The poles that are inside of this rectangle here and have a settling time constrained to that value and also a overshoot constrained in that value because we specify the minimum damping ratio by saying the poles need to be inside of that region. So each of these regions here represents a certain requirement in, in terms of time response. Right? By placing the poles in there, we know that we are going to meet those requirements. How we place the poles in there? Well, we need to play around with our controller now. We can sometimes change the plant transfer function, but we can change the closed loop transfer function by changing the parameters of the controller we have to develop. So let's generalize this idea and try to find a method to locate all these poles. So consider, for example, the following closed loop system. We have a function g of s and we have a controller that is regulating something. And this controller is simply a proportional gain k. We know the closed loop transfer function is the line function divided by 1 plus line function. That's equation 1. And we have the characteristic equation 1 plus k times g of s. Now notice here that a k shows up in the denominator, which means that by changing k, we change the location of the poles. Now we need to be very careful with our design because we may make a system that is stable, unstable, or we can even make a stable system stable by properly regulating um, the system with that control game K. All right, so all we need to know is the characteristic equation and the location of the poles of the characteristic equation. Now let's take this example here, we have a controller that has a proportional gain A and a transfer function there. We can find a closed loop transfer function. And here we have now the characteristic equation is just the denominator of that. We can now take the characteristic equation, equate that to zero to find the location of all poles as K as A in this case varies within a certain range. We could even write this function as A times a ratio of two polynomials, Q of S divided by P of S. Each of these are, um, are functions of S. In this case, P of S is S times S plus one. And now we can make this value of a change from zero to infinity and see what happens, see where the poles go. I'm going to um, modify this a little bit and let's put instead of s uh, one here, let's put an s on top there. Yes. S, 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 there. So on top here we have s, just for clarity, we have Q of S equals to S and P of S equals to S times S plus one. We can rearrange this expression. If you multiply everything by P of S, we have P of S plus A Q of S equals to zero. And you could even further manipulate this to have P of S over A plus Q of S equals to zero. All these are the same equation. Where again, Q of S is S, P of S is S times S plus one. Now what happens when S goes to zero, our starting point? When S goes to zero, we can look at this equation here and you see that this term goes to zero, which means that the poles of the correct, or the poles of the transfer function will satisfy P of S equals to zero. P of S in this case 
uh, is simply s times s plus 1, which means that when a tends to 0, the poles are at 0 because of s and at negative 1. Let me actually do something else here. Let me put s plus 2 on top just to avoid canceling out with the other s there. There. So there is no more, there's no way to simplify this equation. s plus 2, s plus 2. And now what happens to when a tends to infinity? Well, when a tends to infinity, we can look at the last equation in red. And if a is a very large number, now this term goes to 0. And you're left with q of s equals to 0. So when the poles tend to infinity, now the closed loop transfer function or, or the poles of the closed loop transfer function will satisfy q of s equals to 0. And q of s in this case is s plus 2, which means that the pole now is located at negative 2. So from this analysis, we can tell well, very conclude something very important. When the poles go, when the, this controller gain goes to zero, the poles are the poles of P of S, are the poles of the denominator of the characteristic equation. And when the poles are, and when the gain tends to infinity, then the poles go towards the zeros of the characteristic equation. So now we know where they start and where they end. We can simply connect them. And that's the idea behind this analysis. So there is a function in MATLAB that will make this plot for us, but this is where it comes from. By simply realizing that when k goes from zero, or a in this case, from zero to infinity, the poles will migrate from the poles to the zeros of the transfer function. Of the characteristic equation of the transfer function, which in this, in this case turned out to be exactly the same as the uh, line transfer function here, because you have a unit feedback loop. Sorry, can you repeat what you said for when the gain goes to zero? Yeah, so when the gain goes to zero, the poles goes to a, the, the a, a goes to zero. The poles are at the zeros. Sorry, at the poles of s plus two s s plus one and when a tends to infinity the poles go to the zeros of s plus two s s plus one they migrate from the poles towards the zeros Right? And wh wh where is this function here? Well, this function comes from the characteristic equation. We need to prepare the characteristic equation in this form. Times, let me call, what do they call this? Call this h of s. This function here, the, the, the poles and zeros of that function is now the starting point for the poles of the closed loop transfer function and the finish point for the, the poles of the closed loop transfer function. They'll travel from the poles towards the zeros of h of s. And we need to now prepare the characteristic equation always in that form. 1 plus the parameter that is changing times a function of s. In this particular case, h of s turns out to be the same as the open loop transfer function. Right? Because uh, the characteristic equation turns out to be exactly like that. Let's do a more concrete example here. Let me take the same example now. This one, I'm going to go back to the one that I had on top here. And we can find the characteristic equation of this system by simply taking the denominator, equating this to zero. This is the characteristic equation. We can find the poles and the, of this transfer function by now finding the roots of equation number three. And what we see here when you apply the quadratic equation is that we have a fixed real part, a fixed, uh, sorry, we have a real part and an imaginary or something that could potentially be imaginary depending on the value of a. And we will now make a go from zero to infinity 
we'll look what happens to the poles. The poles will be start moving towards each other in this case, like that. And when they reach this point in the center here, one goes upwards and one goes downwards. What can we say? We say that there is a, this particular point happens when A is 1.4. So from A between zero and 1.4, the system is overdamped because all poles are real. And past 1.4, they break away from the imaginary, the real axis, they become complex conjugate numbers. And now the system starts to see some overshoot and is uh, underdamped now. Right? By simply changing the value of A. Um, sorry, we got A equals 1.4 from the quadratic equation, right? A equals to 1.4. Yeah, so when, when A equals to 1.4, yeah, you can see that in the quadratic equation. This is this term is zero. Right? When A is zero, when A equals to 1.4. So we are left with P1 and P2 at that specific point there, negative one and a half. Now we are changing the values of A from zero to infinity. Okay. All right, so let me summarize what we did here. To analyze the influence of a given parameter of interest K, we first must prepare the characteristic equation in the following format. One plus K times H of S. H of S is a generic function of S and the K is the parameter of interest that we want to make change from a from zero to infinity. That's the first step. We take the characteristic equation and we rewrite the characteristic equation in this form. If we simply have a, a closed loop system where k is again like that, then the characteristic equation will immediately fall in that category. But if k is, for example, parameter inside of h of s, then you have to rearrange the characteristic equation in that format first. We'll see how to do that. Now, what I call here the root locus is the set of values of s for which this equation is satisfied as the, as the parameter k varies from zero to infinity. So this plot here, is a root locus. We are solving the characteristic equation of the system for several values of the parameter of interest. So prepare the characteristic equation like that, make the values of k change from zero to infinity, and this plot that we get is what we call the root locus, is a map of all possible location of poles as the parameter goes from zero to infinity. What happens? if our equation doesn't fall in the category, uh, in, in the format we want. For example, here, we know that it needs to calculate the characteristic equation like that. In this case here, if we find the characteristic equation of this system, the characteristic equation, which is the denominator again of the closed loop transfer function, we'll have this format. Now notice here that this doesn't fall, that doesn't follow the format we want because A is now in the denominator. And we want this to be written as one plus a times a function of s equals to zero. So how do you rearrange it? Well, we can simply multiply everything by the denominator. Here it is. We can now group terms that have a and terms that don't have a. So the term here that it doesn't have a is s squared plus one. And a s is the term that has a. And then we simply divide now everything by the terms that I don't have a, which in this case is s squared plus one, divided by s squared plus one, that's the number one we want. And then plus a, s divided by s squared plus one, we end up with the equation in the format we want. And now we can make a change from zero to infinity to find the location of poles. So to do this, we're going to use MATLAB. To create this plot on the right, we're going to use MATLAB. And in MATLAB, 
all we need to do is a command called our locus of the function h of s. In this case, the function h of s is here. We need to define transfer function like that. We input that in MATLAB as our locus of h of s, and MATLAB understands that what we are trying to accomplish here is to look at the root locus from the standard form, one plus a s times s squared plus one. That's the function we want to analyze, and MATLAB immediately knows that a is the parameter that goes from zero to infinity. Okay, and once you do that, this is the, the what we get in the output for this particular example here. When a equals to zero, the poles are located here and there, which turn out to be the so the poles are the poles of the denominator of the transfer function, h of s. Oh, let me repeat that: the poles are the poles of h of s. The poles are the poles of h of s. And as now k starts to increase towards infinity, what happens? These two poles will come together and meet at one point here. One of them goes to the zero, that is the zero of h of s. The other one goes to negative infinity. What, what can we say about this system when you look at this plot? Well, several things. We can say that at first, the system is initially underdamped. And as k starts to increase, or a in this case starts to increase, there is a point where the system is critically damped. And if we increase k or a even more, the system becomes overdamped now. One pole goes to negative infinity, the other one goes to zero. We can also say that the system never goes unstable. We can increase the control a value a as much as we want, and the system never goes unstable. So there's a lot of information about the system by simply looking at this plot. Are there any questions here? Um, sorry, uh, on this slide it says um, if k is, a, is the parameter of interest in the open loop transfer function, but um, the system that we have on the slide isn't open loop? Um, this is a closed loop. That's, yeah. let me, uh, it's not the parameter of, uh, uh, sorry, in the op is not, this this sentence is a bit confusing. If k is the parameter of interest in the open loop transfer function. Oh, okay, yeah, no, that this makes sense. If k is a parameter of interest that is in the, this is the open loop transfer function, it's just this. The sentence makes sense. It's the open loop transfer function is this. This is the open loop. And the whole thing here is the closed loop. All right. So what I mean by that, by that sentence is if k is in the transfer function instead of being here, where the number one is, how do we rearrange the equation in the format we want to be able to plot the root locus? Okay. We'll do an example. This will make more sense with numbers that we do ourselves. Are there any uh, further questions here? No? All right. So here is a summary of what, uh, what we just did. If you want to evaluate the influence of A, write the characteristic equation of the system. This is it. Now rearrange the characteristic equation in the format we want. One plus the parameter times a function of s equals to zero. Define the transfer function in MATLAB. This there's a space missing here. It's transfer function of one, zero. one which basically defines s as a transfer function equals to s we define the equation for this part of the transfer function in matlab and our locus of that now gives us the plot right? matlab knows that what we are trying to achieve here is to plot the root locus for this function when this parameter 
goes from zero to infinity. All right, so h of s is that function, r locus of h will plot the location of all poles as that parameter changes. So there are ways to plot this by hand. Uh, there are several rules that are these, uh, these plots will follow. But we are going to skip that. We're just going to use MATLAB. If you're interested in how to plot these, I have two recorded lectures that I will take like an hour each to be able to plot the, this in detail. But MATLAB does it, it does it better. So let's just use that instead. What we want to achieve here is just to apply the root locus to analyze the root locus for a given system. So these are some of the rules. The most important one that I wanted to retain here is that a k, as k varies from zero to infinity, there will be n of a certain lines in the root locus, and the the poles will go from the poles of the correct equation h of s towards the zeros of the equation h of s. Right, so they travel from one end to another, but all we want to do is to now look at these plots and tell how the system behaves exactly. Let's look at this one, for example. Let's assume that for a given system, we got this plot. What can we see here? We can see that we have three poles. Two of them are coming together and going towards infinity and or through, through those asymptotes, and one of them is going to negative infinity. Let's assume that at this specific point here in the center, k equals to k1, a value of k. And let's assume that a k here is equals to k2. And of course, k2 is greater than k1 because we are increasing the value of k. So when k is between 0 and k1, the poles are here. The system is overdamped. It has no overshoot. If you continue to increase, so as you start to increase k, these two poles are coming together, see the arrows, they will meet at a certain point. Specifically when k equals to k1, the system becomes critically damped. Because the two poles will meet in the, at this point here. What else can we tell here? We can tell that now if we pass k1, if k is greater than k1, but is smaller than k2, how is the system? Is it overdamped, underdamped, unstable, stable, marginally stable? What happens to it? In this specific range between k1 and, and k2, we are here. The poles meet at the center there, and now they are continuing their trip towards the imaginary axis. So we are in the, the green area here. What kind of system are we dealing with? A underdamped system. Why under them? Because now the poles have a complex conjugate, are complex conjugates, they have an imaginary part. The system starts to show oscillations. If you keep increasing k, these poles are continuing to travel and eventually they cross into the unstable region. But before they do that, they will, there will be a point here when k equals to k2, k equals to k2, where the, where the system is critically or margin, sorry, marginally stable. It oscillates forever. And when k is greater than k2, then the system becomes unstable. Why? Because when k is greater than k2, we entered the right side of the S-plane, the system is unstable. What happens to the other pole there, the one that goes to the negative real axis? Well, that one doesn't really do anything. It's just, it just keeps going. The higher k, the farther it gets from the imaginary axis. However, the other two are a bit more problematic because they'll come together 
and then they will split away from the imaginary, the real axis, they will go towards the imaginary axis and eventually make the system unstable. So for this system, it, the value of k, the value of this parameter of interest may make the system unstable. Are there any questions? Um, sorry, can you uh, say well, what, where our graph is for the first um, part for over damp? Yeah, so if we are over damped, the, when you start k is zero, when k is zero, we are here, here, and there. And as k starts to increase, according to this graph, these two poles are going towards each other here, and they will meet in this point. During this entire region here, the system is over damped because the poles are, all three poles are real. At this specific point, you no know, k is increasing, k is zero, and then k is increasing. When k is exactly k one, that's a value to be determined later. The poles are meeting right there, so that's the critical point where the system now changes from over damped to under damped. So at that point specifically, the system is critically damped. Okay, sir. And so the um, sorry, so. The other, the third pole where k equals zero, um, that doesn't, um, it's space between that one and k1 doesn't count for the pole that goes to negative infinity. Uh, yes, well, that pole is also do, uh, uh, moving, but when this is when k equals to zero, and as k increases, it just keeps moving to negative infinity, right? So it the, the, regardless of value, at, at k1 will be somewhere, at k2 it will be somewhere, but it will always be a stable pole, a under damp, a over damped pole, a real pole. So that one doesn't really affect much of time response, but the other two are now getting to the imaginary axis and making the system unstable. Okay, so the two poles on the left, the, the, uh, the right poles, they come together, it's split away and go to the imaginary axis. The other pole just travels to the negative infinity. It's always stable, it's always uh, real, so it's always on over that. As a professor, um, in this kind of case, like if the pole is go to negative infinity or it is always in the left hand side, we can see that, or we can ignore the effect on the system. Well, we, it, it will have an effect on the system because it will create an exponential. But that exponential, oh, okay. that exponential will decay much faster than the other exponentials that are closer to the imaginary axis as we saw before. And so it, okay. will, it will have its effect. It may be negligible, especially in this case for high values of K, but it, it needs to be accounted for. Okay, but it will not influence the uh, stable or unstable because that one always stable, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And just one, one quick question. On the previous slide, there was a list of uh, of characteristics of the root locus method. Yeah. Do we need to memorize all of those? No, we don't need to. Uh, this is, these are just uh, rules to show that we can do this by hand. Some characteristics of it is more for information. We are using MATLAB to plot these. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So let's do another one here. This is what we got from another function. This function would be something like one plus k times s plus a, s plus b divided by s plus c times s plus d. Something like this, two poles, two zeros. And when you plot the root locus for this, this is what we get. So now let's analyze this system. What is happening? These two poles, let's remember that when k is zero, we start at the poles. The poles as k is increased are coming together to this point one goes up, one goes down, they meet again here, one goes to this zero, the other one goes to that zero. Interesting. What can we say about this system? Oops. Let's uh, again define a, a gain here. Let's call this k equals to k1. Let's define another gain here because that's where it changed behavior, k equals to k2. And another value here, k equals to k3, where k3 is greater than k2, which is greater than k1. Because the values of k are 
increasing as we travel along the lines. So for k between 0 and k1, how can you characterize this system? K between 0 and K1. Uh, it's I'm always stable. stable. Yes? It's stable. Stable? Unstable, I think. Unstable? Unst stable or unstable? It's unstable. It is unstable because this pole is still in the unstable region. So that pole goes towards the, the imaginary axis. This one goes towards that point there. So we have now two poles, but one of them, when K is smaller than K1, is located in the unstable region. The entire system is unstable. What happens when K equals to K1? When K equals to K1, then this pole here will be right there. And when k equals to k1, we can say that the system is now marginally stable. Because you're just crossing into the stable zone now. Past that point, k is between k1 and k2. Why? Because we are now in this region, this k is going towards that, this pole is going towards that point, that pole is also going towards that point. They are both in the stable region. What is this, what kind of system are we dealing with? Is the system stable or unstable, first of all? Stable. Stable. Is the system critically damped, over damped, or under damped? Where are the Will poles? be critically damped. Critically damped. Uh, not yet. Not yet, because we are going towards that point. Uh, so long as the poles are different, it's not critically damped. So if we are within that line there, the system is over damped. Yeah. Over damped. The system is critically damped when k equals to k two. Because at k equals to k2, these two poles are meeting right there. They become the same. And then the system is uh, crit critically that. What happens now when k is greater than k2, but it's smaller than k3, which is the gain at this other point there? Underdamped. Underdamped. Where are the poles in that case? Well, the pole, one pole might be up here, the other one might be down there. They are traveling along these parts of the, the line. One is going up, one is going down. So they both have complex parts. The system is underdamped. What happens when k is equal to k3? Now both poles are meeting again here. The system becomes critically damped once again. And what happens when k is greater than k3? System becomes overdamped. Overdamped, very good. Overdamped. Because now we are again on the real axis. And as k keeps increasing, each of these poles will go towards one of the zeros. And the system is again overdamped. Okay, so see how we this system was clearly closed loop unstable because originally had one unstable pole and with the controller we made this go 
um, made, we made it stable. Right? If you if you guys have seen an inverted pendulum before, it's a pendulum that is just a rod like that with a with a weight, and there's a cart under it. And by moving the cart, we want to balance the pendulum. So you always you always want it to stay uh, in upright position. If you create the root locus for such a system, it will be something very similar to this. With a closed loop controller, we can make it stable. And we manipulate the transfer function such that we make the poles move into the stable region. And then the system uh, becomes closed loop stable. Uh, sorry, uh, that um, the system is marginally stable. Is that the same as saying that is it is undamped? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, okay. So there are a few points of interest. The first point is where we cross the imaginary axis. That point we know how to calculate it. We can use the method we saw in the last lecture. There is another point of interest here. Is the point where these poles break away from the imaginary axis, the real axis, and become imaginary because the system goes from overdamped to critically damped. And that's what we call the breakaway point, is where they split away from the, the real axis and become imaginary. Well, to do that is very simple. We can take the transfer function, the characteristic equation of the transfer function like that, and you're simply going to set the value of k to a variable um, called p of x, it's a polynomial. In this particular example here, we would have then one plus p of s times q of s over p of s equals to zero, and we solve for p of s. And p of s is now negative p over q. If we now plot the values of p of s for all possible values of s, then you will see that it will reach its maximum when it breaks away from the imaginary axis, just before it breaks away from the real axis, excuse me. How do you find the maximum of a function? Well, just take the derivative and set that to zero. So if you now take this function, take the derivative of it and set it to zero, we'll see the point where the function reaches its maximum, which is precisely the point where the function is splits away from the real axis. Let's assume that at this point here, we, ha we, we have a point called SB for breakaway. If at that point, the system is splits away from the imaginary axis, what is the value of, the vo of K? at that specific point. Well, just to replace it back into the original equation, we know that a k equals to p of s. So if we evaluate k at p of s b, this gives us the value of k where it breaks away from the imaginary, from the real axis. Right? So we first find the point where it breaks away, which is not the value of the gain, that's the location on the s plane. And once that is done, we evaluate the value of k at that point to find it's the value of k that will make it a breakaway. Let's do one example that includes all this, and this will make more sense. Let's take this function here, for example. What is the breakaway point here? Well, we can set p of s, k to p of s, replace it in here which means that if you rearrange the equation for p of s, we get the polynomial there. You can now multiply this out. Negative s squared plus, uh, what is this? 6s plus 8. Is it? Yep. 2 plus, yep. And you can now take the derivative of p of s with respect to s, and the derivative is 2s plus 6. If you now equate this to zero, the value that it satisfies that is s equals to negative three. In this case, look, we have two poles, one at negative four, one at negative two. They will come together at a given point here, s equals to negative three, and that's the point where they break away. That's not the value of k, that's the point where they break away. So what is k? Well, k is simply p of s at that point, negative three. So k is, now evaluate this function. 
at negative three, we have negative negative three plus two, negative three plus four, which gives a value of k of, what is that? Uh, one, one. And when k equals to one, the pole is at negative three, the system is critically damped, and from that point on, if k now is k is 1.0001, is likely higher than k, we start to see overshoot. The system becomes critically, uh, it becomes uh, over under damped, under damped. Okay. Let's do one example that has everything combined. One, one last thing that I forgot here. So in this case, we are finding this point and the point where they meet and then break away. How do we find the points where we become, the system becomes unstable? Well, for this part here, we can calculate the critical gain using the method we saw in the last lecture, the route Hurwitz stability criterion. We find the critical gain that it will give in our row of zeros in the Routh Hurwitz um, stability criteria. And at that point, we know that the value of k means that the, if we have a row of zeros for that specific value of k, we, the poles lie on the imaginary axis and the system is critically, um, is undamped, is marginally stable, past that it becomes unstable. So with these two points, these two values of k, we can now characterize the entire system. Let's do uh, one example here. I'm going to start with this one to give you, give you an idea of what I want to do. So in this example here, we have the following closed loop control system of a fluid pump where the controller here is simply a function, a simple proportional gain. Notice something about this plant. This plant is unstable. It has a pole at positive two and has a pole and a negative one. One of the poles has a positive real part. The system is, if uncontrolled, is unstable. But we created a closed loop system with a proportional gain K to hopefully stabilize that system. And we want to know the range of K for which the system is still stable. So I'm going to uh, change this problem slightly, just I'm gonna change something really simple here. Uh, I'm going to just swap these two numbers. I want to do minus one and plus two. Just, but it's still the system is still the same. I just reverse the the order there. I found found that this is easier to understand. Okay. Now let's do let's do this one. So we want to know the values of K, we need to map the system, you know, the values of K that will make the system over damped, under damped and so on. Okay, there we are. Okay, so let me write the, uh, the controller gain here is simply K. And here we have one over S minus one, S plus two. Oh yeah, that was far from what I, where I wanted it to be. Let me try again. One over S minus plus two, S minus one. So if you want to do the root locus of this system using this plot, that this function to create this plot, you're going to use MATLAB. It's already here just for to make my, my, my life a little, little easier. What is the characteristic equation of this system? S plus two times S minus one. Times K plus one. Right? The characteristic equation is the, of the closed loop system. So the characteristic equation of the open loop is indeed S plus two times S minus one. If we close the loop, the transfer function becomes y over r, which is k times s plus 2s minus 1 divided by 1 plus k s plus 2s minus 1. 
what we see here is now the characteristic equation has changed. This is the characteristic equation. This is the characteristic equation of the closed loop system. This one, the denominator here, would be the characteristic equation of the open loop system. But we are dealing with the closed loop. If you want to evaluate the root locus, remember that we had to prepare the transfer function or the characteristic equation in this format. And we got lucky. It turns out because here we have a unit feedback loop, we got the function exactly the way we wanted it to be. Where h of s here is simply 1 over s plus 2, s minus 1. Yeah, are we good? Questions here? No? Okay. So now we can plot this using MATLAB. And to do that, we only need to type is R locus H of S. So MATLAB knows what you are trying to do, that there is a gain that multiplies this function in a unit feedback loop. And you're going to make this gain go from zero to infinity. And when you do that, this is the result. This is the plot that we have. We can see the two poles, the pole at negative two, the pole at positive one. We can see that they meet together here some, somewhere and they split up to infinity. What can you say about this system? We can say that the system is originally unstable. You see there's a zero here, a pole that is uh, on the right side of the S-plane and it's coming to the stable zone. This pole is also meeting it there and then they split up. So there are two critical points. Here is one, it's from zero. It's this point about here, right? Is where the pole enters the stable region. And there is another critical point here is where they split up, one goes up, one goes down. So let's start by finding this point here. We remember that a k is zero, k is zero, we are increasing k, they come together and they split. Let's find this point. To find this point, we need to take the characteristic equation and replace k with p of s. So we have one plus p of s times 1 over s plus 2 s minus 1. Equated this to 0, so p of s is k. p of s, if we rearrange this, is going to be negative s plus 2 s minus 1, which is negative, what is this, s squared plus s minus 1. We can now take the derivative with respect to s. Sorry, for the previous one, isn't it minus two? Minus two, yes, thank you. Minus two. What is the derivative here? Is two s plus one. When you set this to zero, to now find the point where the function reaches its maximum, S is negative 0 0.5, which is precisely what the plot shows. It shows that they meet at 0 0.5. This is the breakaway point. This is the point where these two poles are coming together, preparing to become unstable. What is the value of K there? Well, to evaluate K, now remember that a K is P of S because that's how we set here. So P of S equals to K. And if you now evaluate, if we evaluate K at P of negative 0 0.5, we can find the value of K. And this can be taken from here. K equals to negative 0 0.5 plus two times 0 0.5 minus one. What is the result here? Zero point 
2.25. Yeah. I calculated somewhere I lost it. Yeah, 2.25. So at this point, uh, sorry, this point here, K equals to 2.25. What is this point? Well, this point is the point where the system becomes unstable or, or becomes a stable in this case because we enter the stable zone. How do we find it? For that, we can use the route Hurwitz stability criterion from the last lecture. So to do that, we can go back here, take the equation, rewrite this equation, just to multiply everything by the denominator there. We have S plus two, S minus one plus K equals to zero. Solve for this, S is, which is the same as there, S squared plus S minus two plus K equals to zero. That's now the characteristic equation. Let's do the route Ritz array here, S is zero. What goes in here? What's the first element? Draw the last lecture. One. One. Down here. One. One. Up there. Negative two. Negative two plus k, right? Plus k. Yeah. 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 And then zero. And if you complete this down here is negative two plus k. And this is zero. So for this to be stable, we want negative two plus k to be greater than zero, which means that a k must be greater than two. So at this point here, k equals to two. How do I know that that point k is equal to two? Notice that when k is equal to two, we have an entire row of zeros. And this characterizes poles lying on the imaginary axis. And it's precisely where it goes. Precisely where it goes. So now we have the two points of interest. We can analyze the entire system. K is increasing. K is starting here at zero, here at zero. It's increasing and then splitting up there. So when K equals two or between zero and two, what kind of system are we dealing with? Unstable. Unstable. Very good. Why unstable? Because this pole hasn't reached this point yet. It's somewhere around here. We'll make the entire system unstable. That pole will be somewhere there, but it doesn't matter because there is one unstable pole. So this system is unstable. When K equals to two, what happens? Marginally stable. Marginally stable. When K is now be greater than two, but is smaller than 2.25. What happens? So when K equals to two, you're here. You're just entering the stable zone. When you reach this point, something else happens, but when K is between two and 2.5, 25, what, what is the result? It's a un overdamped system. When K equals to 2.25, what happens? Critically damped. Critically damped, critically damped. Very good. And when K is greater than 2.25, Then we have a underdent. Underdent, very good. Underdent. Right, because now we passed at this point here. The poles are either one is here, one is there. They have no complex parts. 
the system is over there. Any questions? Um, sorry, can you just quickly repeat uh, how we got s plus two, s minus one plus k? S plus two, where, where s plus two? So um, after we got k equals 2.25, we wrote uh, s plus two, um, s minus one plus k, yeah, there. Yeah, so just taking this equation here, equating that to zero. All right, so multiply that and that. Right, like following this equation, basically, you just you have k of uh, this expression here. Let me write it. Right? So we have one plus k divided by s plus two s minus one equals to zero, which is the same as s plus two s plus one plus k equals to zero, which is that. Thanks. How come k equals two doesn't look like it's on the imaginary axis, even though it's the crossover point? Yeah, it should be, should be. I, I have a bit of difficulty seeing here, but it should be exactly on the imaginary axis. Okay. I just wanna show you guys what happens with the original problem. The original problem was these signs here were swapped. So we had plus, uh, minus, and plus. If it is swapped, then this point where they meet would actually be plus 0 0.5. S equals to plus 0 0.5. They would always meet in the unstable region. So this pole there would never leave the unstable region. You know, the system would always be unstable. That's why I changed it. Right? If we swap this, the, the points here, then this point becomes negative 0.5. So the system now has a chance to be stable if you control the game K. But if it was the other way around, they would actually meet in the unstable region at plus 0.5. So this pole will always be unstable. And then the entire system is always unstable regardless of the value of K. Okay, so if that is indeed the case, then we should see uh, something like, I think the only difference would be a negative sign here. Meaning that regardless of the value of K, there is always going to be, there are always going to be a, one stable, uh, an unstable system, regardless of what we put in there. All right, so it, it needs to be consistent with the route Hurwitz array. I'll post the full solution. Okay, so this lecture has a lot of contents, a lot of information. It will take some time to digest. There is a few more exercises I'm gonna post the solution for. Uh, and uh, again, uh, we don't need to draw these plots ourselves. Uh, if, uh, if for, for folks taking purely control systems, they are required to do that by hand. Well, all you need to do in the context of uh, this course is to look at a plot like this and be able to tell how the system behaves. Right? Later, this will also come in handy when we change this controller to something else, because we could have in this controller here, we could have, uh, we could add a zero, for example, or we could have another pole. And if we add another zero, how would this look like? Right? It would completely change. If we add another pole, it would completely change again. In this particular case, it's just a proportional gain. So that makes our analysis relatively straightforward. But for cases where, for example, in the other example where I, this would be flipped, we saw that the system was always unstable. Well, provided that we are not adding poles or zeros here because we could add a pole or zero there and then make the system stable instead. So this sort of analysis will guide us in that design process of finding the best controller to stabilize the uh, otherwise unstable plant.